Right, let's get started. Remember, you still have extra credit assignments. Um, those, I believe I made them due on Friday, but we're not going to be here Friday, so you can turn them in on Monday over the weekend. Hopefully, hopefully most of you have turned in your LEQs. Today, I'm going to be grading it for completion. I'm not really going to read it. Gross. I'm not going to read your LEQs today. Instead, I'm looking at whether or not you gave it a try. What I want you to do, though, after this today, after class today, if you want to get a good grade on your final exam, uh, I'm sorry, in your final um, draft on Monday, is there's a app, I know Ms. Pena probably used it already, it's called Class Companion. You can find it on Clever. I also gave you a uh, link on your Google Classroom on the LEQ section. On here, you can go ahead and copy and paste your work, your LEQ, and it's going to grade it for you and it will tell you the score that you would have gotten um, if this was your actual AP exam grade. And it's also going to give you um, feedback on what you need to fix and how else you need, to, uh, how else are you going to need to, what else are you going to need to add in order to get the point that, um, that you want. So go ahead and do that after class today so that you can look at the score that you would have gotten and then you can fix your essay accordingly. What you should be aiming for is before Monday, that should be at least a five or six registering for the AI. And then on Monday, I'll grade it personally, and hopefully you get the grade that you want. Anybody have any questions? You can do this multiple times. So once you submit, you don't like the grade that you got, edit it, fix it according to the comments, according to the feedback, and then submit it again. I think you can do it eight times. Most of you, that's good enough for most of you. If you need more, let me know. Now, you can come to me if after you submitted it on Class Companion and you don't understand the feedback, you don't understand what you need to fix, then you can come to me and we can go, I can go ahead and help you with what you need to fix on your essay. Please do that before Monday. Any questions? So after today, during lunch, or when you have free time in your other classes, not in this class because we don't have free time here at all, um, go ahead and upload it or copy and paste it on Class Companion. It'll tell you what you need in order to score what you want to score. Anybody confused? All right, let's go ahead and get started for today. We have a lot to talk about. So this unit, after World War II, two, two major developments are happening. One of them is the Cold War, but the other one is decolonization, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. After World War II, Newly independent states were created. About 80 newly independent states were created in the years following World War II. Decolonization is the trend. Empires are falling apart after World War II. Now, these newly independent states, they receive independence in one or two ways. One is negotiations. Sometimes colonies successfully negotiate with their mother country for independence. What would be the other one? War. War. The other one would be armed conflict. Some states are not so lucky to just be given independence by their mother country. Sometimes they have to go to war. They have to fight for their independence, just like the United States did in 1776. Any questions? So today, we're going to focus first on the states that won their independence through negotiations. Probably the best example is India. India has been a British colony for many years. It is the crown jewel of the British Empire. It is their most profitable colony. Their most profitable, their most prosperous colony. Britain actually spent a lot of money investing in Indian infrastructure. Britain made a lot of investment, paid a lot of money to develop the infrastructure of India, to modernize India. They paid for railroads, they paid for ports. Why? To benefit the people of India? No, to benefit their own economic interests. The goal is they can deliver those products, those goods from India faster and more efficiently and more cost effectively. So Britain made a lot of investments to develop India for their own economic benefit, not for the people of India's benefit. But there was unintended consequences of this. As India modernized, India had a growing middle class. A middle class that can afford to send their sons, typically not their daughters, but their sons, to school where they receive Western-style education. 
So this is very similar to what happened with the Creoles in Latin America. A lot of them receive Western style education. And once you get educated on the Western style, what do you get exposed to? Enlightenment ideas. Enlightenment ideas like popular sovereignty, democracy, social contract, and most importantly, you get exposed to nationalism. So this is the beginnings of Indian nationalism in India, as more and more of these educated people are advocating for independence. And this is a trend for many of these colonies. A lot of these independence movements are going to be started by the educated. We saw that in the United States. Thomas Jefferson, our founding fathers, were educated people, educated under the Enlightenment. We saw that in Latin America, like Simon Bolivar and all those Creoles that started those Latin American revolutions are educated. And we're going to see that after World War II in Asia and Africa, as many of these co former colonies are advocating for independence. The Indians were allowed to create a group of uh, a body, a political body known as the Indian National Congress. This is a body of Indians who can petition the British government, who can express the wants, the needs, the grievances of the Indian people. And a lot of times what they advocated for is more independence, more autonomy for the Indian people. A lot of times though, those petitions made by the Indian National Congress were ignored by the British government. So this is a group of Indians who can formally petition the British government. And they often petition for more independence, they often petition for more autonomy, and a lot of those petitioning were largely ignored by the British government. Mahatma Gandhi, uh, a leading figure of the Indian independence movement, was actually a part of this Congress. He was actually the president of the Indian National Congress. But again, they didn't make a lot of, uh, a lot of headway when it comes to more independence for India. World War I, we see a lot of Indian troops participating in the war, and after the war, they expected more independence from the British. They weren't given that, and that kind of made them organ more organized. Mahatma Gandhi, there's only nine people in AP world history whose name you actually need to remember. This is one of them. Mahatma Gandhi started organizing the Indian resistance movement, the Re Indian independence movement, and he started various movements more, more often than not, these are nonviolent movements. What do we call these nonviolent movements? Civil disobedience, right? In order to advocate for Indian independence. That's why you need to remember him. He performed several acts of civil disobedience. He started nonviolent movements in order to advocate for Indian independence. What are some of these movements? The Salt March. Well, you have Indians marching towards the beach, and then they picked up salt, which was illegal under British law. They were protesting the British monopoly on salt. And what's the other one? The textiles, we call it the homespun movement, where he advocated for the Indians to make their own clothing, protesting the Indian monopoly on textiles on clothing. World War II, same thing happened. Indian troops, about two million of them, participated in World War II on behalf of the British Empire. They won but they weren't given independence, despite the fact they expected independence. And that discrepancy between expectation and reality will galvanize them and intensify the Indian independence movement. But this time around, after World War II, things are going to be different. What's going to happen to a lot of these imperial powers after World War II? They're going to be severely weakened by the war, financially and militarily. So Britain was weakened by the war, especially financially. And something else is happening after World War II. Even back at home in Britain and France and many of the countries in Europe, public support for colonization is diminishing, it's decreasing. And it's turning to decolonization, it's turning to self-determination. So even the British people itself, even the British public and the British government, many of these people are advocating to let go of their colonies, to end the British Empire. So support in the British public and the British government for colonization, oh sorry, for decolonization is actually increasing during this time. And as a result of all these factors, the British unable to control their colonies any longer, the British public turning against imperialism. In 1947, the Indians were able to negotiate for independence. So in 1947, the Indians were successfully able to negotiate for their own independence. 
thanks to leaders like Mahatma Gandhi, this was relatively bloodless. All right, another colony, also a British colony, that successfully negotiated independence is the country of Ghana in 1957. Ghana is where? Where's that at? In Africa, in West Africa. So this is in West Africa. The British called it the Gold Coast Colony. Much like in India, Ghana is going to be successfully able to gain its independence through negotiations. A relatively bloodless um, independence process. Just like in India, they have a nationalist figure. Mahatma Gandhi was an Indian nationalist. Kwame Nkrumah is going to be an African nationalist. He also believed in nonviolence, civil disobedience, and he will lead the Ghanan independence movement. He believed in pan-Africanism. We'll talk about that more later on, but this is the unification of the African people. The unification of the African people. So why did the British, why did they let go of Ghana? Same reasons in India. Diminish support for colonization. Back in Britain, the public is turning against imperialism. And a weakened Britain after the war that no longer has the finances to be able to suppress a lot of these independence movements. So that's why Ghana became independent in 1957. Very similar trajectory to India. They both have a nationalistic leader, and they were able to both negotiate for their independence, taking advantage of the weakened state of Britain and the public support turning against imperialism. Here's your first questions. One, uh, three minutes, please. We have a lot to talk about today. Got three minutes. Pick one. You don't have to talk about both. Pick one. About a minute left. We're only going to talk about one, guys. All 
All right, got to move on. <clears throat> Ghana and India are lucky in that their quest for independence was relatively bloodless, but some states are not so lucky. Some states had to fight for their independence. So some colonial independence process turned violent because of the amount of resistance against decolonization. The amount of resistance against decolonization. In some colonies, within those colonies, there are some resistance against becoming independent. This is especially evident in colonies that have a sizable European white population. Some of these colonies have many European whites that have migrated over the years. And when it's time for independence after World War II, these white immigrants, these white settlers in these colonies are going to be the ones or one of the ones that are going to stand in the way of independence. What do we call these colonies that had a sizable immigrant settle, a settler population? Settler colonies. Like Australia and South Africa, for example, are settler colonies. Like the 13 colonies were settler colonies as well. So one instance of that is Algeria. Algeria is part of North Africa. This is Egypt right here. It used to be a British colony. But most of North Africa used to be French territory. They used to be French colonies. After World War II, Morocco and Tunisia, Algeria's neighbors, were able to peacefully negotiate for independence. The French just let them go through negotiations. So Algeria, France peacefully negotiated independence for Algeria's two neighbors, Tunisia and Morocco. But Algeria is going to be a different story. France is going to hold on more tightly to Algeria, mainly because Algeria had a sizable French population. A lot of French people migrated to Algeria over the years. And these French citizens are going to stand in the way of decolonization. They're going to resist decolonization of Algeria. That's why France had a hard time letting go of Algeria. This is going to lead to the native inhabitants of Algeria, particularly two groups of people, Arabs and Berbers, organizing an armed rebellion against the French. They will organize a group called the National Liberation Front, and they will fight for independence. They will fight against the French. So they will, this will spark a violent conflict between the French and the native Algerians. This is going to be a long, protracted conflict between the native inhabitants of Algeria in North Africa and the French. But as the years went by, the French figured out it's no longer worth it to hold on to Algeria when most of Algerians wanted independence. So the French president, Charles de Gaulle, negotiated for the Algerians' independence. So the French finally gave, after years of fighting, a violent conflict, Algeria became an independent country in 1965, despite the protests of many of the French citizens that lived in Algeria. Any questions about that? Relatively simple. Angola. Angola we talked about already. Angola used to be a Portuguese colony. Three political groups united together in arms to fight against Portuguese rule in Angola. Angola is in Africa, in southern Africa. And three political groups rose up to fight for independence against the Portuguese. That war is going to be a very long war. They're going to take advantage of a weakness in Portugal. In 1974, Portugal saw a peaceful transition of power. But during that time, Portugal was weakened. So they're going to be able to win independence as a result. Angola successfully won independence, again, through armed conflict. They had to fight for it. People had to die for it. For independence. But as you all know, after Angola became an independent country, what happened to these three political groups after they receive independence from Portugal? They turn on each other and, and that started the Angolan Civil War. So after independence, we get the Angolan Civil War, where these three political groups are vying for control over this newly independent country. When before they were united against the Portuguese, now they're fighting one another. They succumb to infighting. And we get ourselves a bloody civil war that will last 27 years. And who became involved in the Angolan civil war? Became involved. In the, we talked about the Angolan civil war in this class before. Some of you wrote about it. The United States will be one. So if the U.S. is involved, who else is going to be involved? 
the Soviet Union is also going to be involved, making the Angolan Civil War an example of what? A proxy war. Another country that had to fight for independence is the Southeast Asian country of Vietnam. Vietnam used to be whose colony? Uh, well, kind of. The French. Vietnam used to be a French colony. In World War II, Japanese occupation weakened French control over Indochina. An independence group led by a communist, led by a Vietnamese nationalist communist called Ho Chi Minh, his name is Ho Chi Minh, declared independence. So he appealed to concepts of nationalism and self-determination and declared Vietnamese independence after the war. However, the French were not willing to let go of their Southeast Asian colony, so the French tried to reestablish control over Vietnam. So they were kicked out by the Japanese during the war, but now the war is over, the Vietnamese people declared independence, but the French were still not willing to let them go. So this will lead to an armed struggle. This will lead to a war for independence, a war of independence for the Vietnamese people. They will be led by a communist named Ho Chi Minh, and they will try to win their independence. This war resulted in a peace treaty in which Vietnam was divided into two. Vietnam will be given independence, but it will be divided into two. One communist government in North Vietnam, and one kind of democratic government backed by the French in South Vietnam. So you got North Vietnam, a communist state, and you got South Vietnam, a western back state. All right, now, this was supposed to be temporary, the United Nations, during this peace treaty, negotiated that in 1956, the people of Vietnam will be given self-determination and they will be given an election to choose for themselves what kind of Vietnam do they want. Do they want a communist Vietnam or do they want a democratic Vietnam? But those 1956 elections that were promised to the Vietnamese people never happened. Anybody know why? Who got in the way of those elections? The United States did. Why did we get in the way? Because we knew if those elections were allowed to happen, what's going to happen? Most of the Vietnamese people are going to choose the communist government. And we didn't want that. So we got in the way of their self-determination. North Vietnamese people got really, really mad. The North Vietnamese government under Ho Chi Minh got mad. And they launched an invasion of South Vietnam to unify Vietnam by force. If the West is not going to allow Vietnam to unify peaceably, they're going to do it by force. So North Vietnamese troops invaded South Vietnam, and that war for independence escalates into what the United States calls, or what you guys call, the Vietnam War. In which the United States sent troops, China and the Soviet Union, supported the Northern Vietnamese, and we get ourselves another proxy war. After years of fighting, who had to withdraw from Vietnam? The United States. The United States had to withdraw soon after Northern Vietnamese troops conquered all of Vietnam and united Vietnam under communist rule. Today, Vietnam is technically a communist state. Technically, because they still have some free market principles in their country as well. The casualties in the Vietnam War were about 2 million Vietnamese on both sides as, as well dying. And you have Southern Vietnamese who were sympathizers of the communists who actually fought against the Americans as well. We call them the Viet Cong, and they engaged in guerrilla tactics. That's why Vietnam was so hard for the United States. It was an unconventional war. And about 58,000 Americans are going to die including some people that you might know, your grandparents or your great-grandparents. In the 1980s, the United States and Vietnam reestablished rela uh, a relationship, diplomatic relationship. Today, the United States and Vietnam, we have a good relationship with one another. We have an economic relationship. We have a diplomatic relationship. We have Vietnamese restaurants all over the United States today. 
Yes, ma'am. No, it's a unified country, technically under communism, because we lost in Vietnam. So this kind of dispels the myth that if a country, if a state falls under communism or socialism, that they're, not, they're no longer going to deal with the United States, which is not the case. So a lot of the Cold War, us trying to prevent these states from becoming communist and socialist, might have been for nothing. Because what happened here in Vietnam proves that even though they became communists, they still dealt with the United States. They still were willing to have a relationship with the United States. And they didn't go closer to the Soviet Union at all. They actually got closer to the United States instead. All right, let's move on. Next question. Pick one. You got three minutes. Take about 30 seconds left, and we're going to have to move on. All right, got to move on. So hopefully most of you have noticed a pattern by now. After World War II, we get many of these colonies becoming independent states. And right after many of these colonies get independence, what tends to happen? War and conflict. So many newly independent states succumb to civil wars and internal conflicts right after they become independent. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. Right after they achieve independence, they become their own country. They succumb to a lot of infighting. They succumb to civil war. The root cause, there's many causes of a lot of these conflicts following independence, but the root cause of it is imperialism. A lot of the borders, the national borders that we have right now, were drawn by European imperialists. 
they were inherited by these newly created nations after World War II, but the borders of nations were mostly drawn by white people according to their own interests, not paying attention to the wants and needs of the people that actually lived there. So the root causes of many of these violent conflicts were the colonial borders drawn by white imperialists that will be inherited by these new countries that, were, uh, that are going to develop after World War II. So I'll give you examples of that. That can happen in one or two ways. First, rival groups become a part of the same country. Rival groups become a part of the same country. We talked about Rwanda and how after they got independence, the Houthi and the Tutsi went to war with one another. That resulted in the genocide in Rwanda. Here's another example. This is the modern day state of the Philippines in Southeast Asia. It was colonized by two imperial powers. First, it was colonized by who? Who used to have the Philippines? Spain used to be a Spanish colony, and then after the Spanish-American War, it was turned over to the United States, right? This is the Philippines today. The borders of the Philippines were defined by Spain. Spain says that's the Philippines. And then when the United States took over, same borders. And then after the war, the United States gave the Philippines its independence. But there's a group of people in the Philippines, especially here in the southern part of the Philippines, who are Muslims, while the rest of the Philippines, because of their Spanish colonial past, were Catholics. They don't identify with the rest of the Filipinos in their country. What they want is what? What do these Islamic groups in, in the southern portion of the Philippines want? Their own country, because they don't identify with the rest of the Filipinos in their country. So they want their own state, an Islamic state in the Philippines, and right now, that's causing a lot of conflicts in this country. A lot of times, violent conflicts in this country where you have Islamic separatist group that want to separate the southern portion called Mindanao from the Philippines. This is an example of what went on in a lot of these states because the way the borders are drawn were to the benefit of white people without, getting, without giving regard to the people that actually live in these places. It results in a lot of this conflict. Next. Another reason why this can um, lead to a conflict is sometimes the people that share the same nationality, people that share the same identity, culture, religion, they get separated into different states. They get separated into different states. Probably the best example of this is in the Middle East. In the Middle East, there's a good group of people called Kurds. There's millions and millions of them that live in the Middle East. However, after World War I, when the European powers broke up the Ottoman Empire and they started creating these mandates, the Kurdish people were separated into different states. Some of them find, found themselves, after World War I, living in Turkey. Some of them found themselves living in Syria. Some of them found themselves living in Iraq. There is no such thing as a Kurdistan today, but that's what the Kurdish people want. And oftentimes, that can lead to armed conflicts and violence. And it all stems back from the ugly legacy of imperialism when these borders are drawn. Does that make sense for everybody? All right. So let's talk about some examples of that. So regional, religious, and ethnic movements are going to challenge colonial borders after World War II. There are many people who are going to challenge the colonial borders that were inherited by these newly independent states. So let's talk about some of them. First, let's talk about Nigeria. Nigeria today is the most populous state in um, Africa. It gained its independence from Britain in 1960. However, seven years later, like, is, like the trend in a lot of these newly independent states, they get a civil war. The reason for the civil war is in the southern portion of Nigeria, there live a people called the Igbo people who believe that they are separate from the rest of the Nigerians. They have a separate national identity and they wanted their own state. So they seceded from Nigeria and they attempted to establish their own country called Biafra. Is there a state today called Biafra? No. no. Because this attempt to secede failed. The Nigerians will quell this rebellion. So after three years of violence, Nigeria 
ended the civil war. But not until a lot of people die. But this is an example of an ethnic group challenging the borders that were established in the past that were inherited by Nigeria. Hey, the only reason why we're part of your country is because the British said that we're a part of your country, but we're not really the same as you. All right, moving along. Second example would be our neighbor up north, Canada. In Canada, the largest province in Canada is Quebec, Canada. Quebec was actually established by French settlers who trapped fur during the colonial era. But later, during a famous war that you guys should know of, it's called the Seven Years' War, also known as the French and Indian War, Quebec was turned over to the British. So it became a British colony instead. The whole of Canada became a British colony as well. But the people of Quebec, they found themselves very different from the rest of Canada. They spoke French. What do the rest of Canada speak? They speak English, because again, most of them were descendants of English settlers that came from England. And they had a distinct culture. They had different food. They had different languages. They had different music. So this gave rise to a new national identity within Canada, a separate identity called French Canadian. So this gave rise to French Canadian nationalism, French Canadian nationalism who many people in Quebec believe is different enough from the rest of Canada to warrant their own what? Their own country. So when Britain gave Canada its independence, the people of Quebec wanted to separate from Canada because they didn't feel like they belonged within the borders of Canada because they felt like they have a separate identity, the French Canadian identity. So in the 1960s, there was this movement called the Quiet Revolution. This is a movement that advocated for independence for Quebec. Independence for Quebec. So you have a group of people who are unsatisfied with the borders that were inherited from Canada's imperial past that want to break away. In 1995, the people of Quebec were actually given a choice. They held a referendum, a vote, on whether or not Quebec will stay in Canada or whether or not Quebec will become independent. Today, do we have a country called Quebec? We do not, because this referendum will fail more, by a narrow margin. Most of the people that voted, voted to stay with Canada and not separate from Canada. But again, this is an example of what, you, of what happened after, coloniz after decolonization, where you have people challenging the modern day borders. But the best example that you should include on your FRQs is a religious group known as the Muslim League challenging um, these borders. I told you before that India negotiated for independence. During those negotiations, you all remember, India has this religious divide. The majority of India is what? Hindu. And the minority is Muslim. They have a sizable Muslim minority. During the negotiations between Britain and India, for independence, the Muslim minority became very worried that if India does get into its independence, they're going to be severely outnumbered in government, which means the Muslims in India are going to be marginalized. If India does become an independent state, the Muslims within that new country are going to be marginalized by a mostly Hindu government. Their wants, their needs are not going to be paid attention to because the government is going to be mostly Hindu. So a religious movement started called the Muslim League. They are a political party who advocated for a separate state for, Islam, for Muslim Indians. So they advocated for a separate state for Muslim Indians. They advocated for if India does become a separate, uh, an independent state, they wanted their own state carved up from the Indian subcontinent. So this led to Britain agreeing, and this led to Britain partitioning India. You need to know that word, the Indian partition. 
If I'm partitioning something, what am I doing to it? I'm dividing it. I'm parting it. So the agreement was India will become an independent state and it, become, it will become a state for the Hindus while northern India will be turned and be separated from the rest of India and it will become a Muslim state. A Muslim state that we call what? Pakistan. So Pakistan will be established as a state for Muslim Indians while India will become a state for the Hindu Indians. So this is called the Indian Partition. Now, the Indian Partition was not a very smooth process. The British didn't really prepare India for this partition all that much, which will cause a lot of chaos, as many people in India found themselves on the wrong side of the border. If you're a Hindu Indian living in North India, you found yourself in a country that's going to be dominated by Muslims and vice versa. So this will lead to massive migrations as Hindu Indians flee northern India to get to India and you have Muslim Indians fleeing India to get to Pakistan. And this massive migration will cause violence with casualties ranging up to a million people dead as a result of these massive migrations that were happening after India was partitioned. You ever seen that Marvel TV show? I think it's called Miss Marvel. Um, one episode there talks about the Indian partition and how chaotic that time was for the people of India and for the people of Pakistan as they're trying, are trying to flee from and crossing one border to another. All right, lastly, we get the transnational movements. This is easy, hopefully, to understand. We talked about transnational corporations, corporations that, have, that do business across countries. That's what transnational means. Many people today are part of these transnational movements. They believe that we need to redraw the borders of these countries, redraw borders. They imagine a post-colonial world where the borders are not inherited from the borders that were established by white people during imperialism, but instead the borders should be according to a shared identity, culture, religion, nationality. So according to transnational ethnic and cultural identities, instead of what was drawn during imperialism, what was inherited from the white people that drew these lines. A lot of these borders, according to people that believe in these transnational movements, don't make any sense. They separate people who have something in common with one another. And they're only being separated because a long time ago, a white person drew that line. So, there's two of these transnational movements that you need to know about. First, Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism advocates for a united Africa. The people that believe in Pan-Africanism, including the president of Ghana that we talked about before, believe that the African people shared the same struggle during imperialism. Some of them were shipped off to slavery. Some of them were colonized, but they shared the same struggle. And that is enough for them to form their own state, to form their own country. All these borders that divide Africa today were borders drawn by the imperialists, and they don't really make any sense to them. Then you have Pan-Arabism, very similar, only it advocates for the unification of which people? The Arab people, the Arab world. All these mostly Arab countries, mostly Muslim countries should unite together. And the borders that divide them today don't really make any sense because they were drawn by European imperialists, according to these movements anyway. All right, we don't have a lot of time left, so... Yes? Oh, instead of the borders drawn by imperialists. All right. We're going to go ahead and end today because I had to end with my other classes. Keep your papers. We'll finish tomorrow. No. Um, take advantage of the time left to kind of upload or copy and paste your, your essay to Class Companion, see what you have gotten, and try to fix.